Thank you again for joining me on another episode of Public Comment, a podcast about politics and philosophy for critical, creative, and introspective thinkers. Today is going to be a rather special episode. Not that I don't like to think of each episode as each each one being unique and special, but this one is uh, going to be, I guess, emotional. And also, I think there's going to be a lot of sense of really what's sort of deeply foundational to who I am is about to come out in this piece, because I'm going to be talking to you about my grandparents, and realize one's grandparents will mean different things to different people, and there's a lot of different approaches one could take in having such a conversation. But my grandparents, first and foremost, are so much a part of who I am, and I don't talk about it enough, or haven't talked about it enough, or haven't explored it enough, or delved into it enough, to be honest with you. There are a lot of parts of life that, depending on where you are in your own life, that could be, that find themselves put on the side, not quite as examined as maybe they should be. For me, I've spent a lot of time trying to have some sense of career and trying to have some meaningful accumulation of knowledge, I get so caught up in these things and my sense of productivity (laughs) that sometimes thinking about these very deeply personal things like family I just don't talk about so much. And as I share this with you now, I already feel really guilty not having talked to you about my grandparents more. I know I've mentioned them here and there, but I just don't even know how to reiterate to you how much I believe the way my soul, the way my mind and personality has been formulated owes itself to my grandparents. I would say probably more than my father in a lot of ways. My father, I wouldn't say was absent in my life. You know, him, I, there is, uh, well, you know, my, my mother and my father got divorced when I was my mother left my father when I was three, three and a half. And so we would only see my father approximately every other weekend. That said, I spent my father's final months on this earth. I actually spent with him taking care of him as he was suffering pretty severely from Parkinson's disease. And I did get to know my father quite well. However... And even with the experiences I had with him, I guess he, I feel that he wasn't as broad ranged in the kinds of conversations that he could have that, uh, in contrast to my grandparents. And there was a time when I had a lot of disdain for my father when I was really young. I can't even begin to describe the depths of it for you, except to say I remember we were really young here. I mean, maybe five, six years old. I can remember being out to lunch, perhaps, with my grandparents. And I started going on to them about how I wanted to beat up my father because I thought he was mean or something like that. The point is that there was a time in my life when... There was a really 
dark association that I had with my father. There was a period when he was, shall we say, to put it rather kindly, uh, verbally abusive. It is what it is. There was a time, I, I mean, the awful things he would say, and these kinds of things that you wonder where the hell they come from, honestly, the things he would say. One of the strangest things, I don't know what he got so mad about. We were outside I don't know, doing something in his garage, and he just had this outburst and said something like calling me a pussy Jew, shithead pussy Jew, or something like that. And, I mean... Where do you come up with that? And where do you come up with that talking to such a small person? I mean, I couldn't have been older than, what, 14, maybe, when he said that. My grandparents never spoke to me like that, ever. My father, on the other hand, was known to say these kinds of things. He, he was the kind of person to say, on occasion, Sean, get out of here. Just like that. He had once said, come here so I can hit you. He often called us nitwits. Not the nastiest thing he could say. My point being, though, when you're young and you start to make these associations about the people you're, you're closest to in your life, my father started out rather dark. It didn't end that way, but... And there are plenty of wonderfully nice things I could say about my father. However, when you contrast him to my grandparents, they did not share his approach in dealing with people, at least for sure not with me. I know that to be a fact. And actually, my grandparents, so it's not, again, it depends on, it's, I always talk about context and these kinds of things. Everybody has different kinds of relationships with different kinds of people in their lives. You can't really have too much of a broad, all-encompassing... There's not too much you could say universally about having a grandparent. There are some things. I'm not here to really quite go into the universal on it. In this case. You know, on my father's side, I never met my grandfather. And the story goes that he was not a nice fellow either. And so, on my dad's side of the family, I suppose there's that story of just the uh, ever-going cycle of the angry father. I don't know, because I don't know anything about his father either. My father's father's. My father's father's father. My great-grandfather. I don't know anything about him. In terms of personality and how he raised his children and such... On my grandparent, on my mother's side, though, it's a totally different story. You know, as for my grandmother on my father's side, she suffered severe depression, and there's very little I could even therefore tell you about her personality because it was so so much of who she was that I was exposed to was just depression. My memories are of her are going to the nursing home where she lived. And her having very, very little to say. I m Maybe a question or two about, like, how old are you? Or how was school? Or something like that. But she, I, I don't remember her having any remarkable kind of interest in my me or my siblings. My siblings or I. My, or even my father, for that matter. There was never really any sense that there was so much to the, their relationship. As for the, my grandparents on my mother's side, it's a totally different story. So it is interesting just how different relationships could be. So anyway, the way this all gets brought up and the reason I chose today to chat with you in particular about my grandparents on my mother's side. Yesterday, 
my family got together and we scattered their ashes on the upon the into the Atlantic Ocean. And it's actually more emotional for me now as I think about it. At that point in time, I don't know, being on a boat in the ocean. It had been so long since I was on a boat. And it had been so it had been a year I don't even remember the last time I'd been on a boat to give you some idea. Some time when I was a teenager. Probably at least 15, 16, 17 years, I think, since I've been on a boat, to the best of my memory. I just have, I don't remember being on a boat in a very long time. So, that was all so invigorating that it was hard to, it it was very difficult to get too much past just the profound invigorating, profoundness of the invigoration, and the beauty of the ocean, and it's inter- we all think different ways, right? So like the way my mind went was I, I then start thinking about questions of the existence of God and I start thinking about life and death as these general themes, concepts. And, oh, you know, your life flashes before your eyes and you have this question about who am I really and think about the how surreal it is to be in this place and time with your extended family. I got to see all of my cousins. It's the first time all of the cousins have been together since I honestly don't remember when. It's probably been over a decade. There are six of us. I am the oldest one. And it, so then you start to think about family and love, and it was wonderful, my wife being there, my mother, my stepfather, my aunts, my uncles, and my cousins, and you do get a sense, well, I got, you know, there was a sense that that is exactly perhaps what my grandparents would have liked. They really did love family. That was something they really valued. So, yes, scattering their ashes in the sea. It was weird watching the ashes actually fall into the ocean because those ashes... What's that expression? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, is that it? Um, That which used to be their body, now ash... That in itself, I I have no desire to be cremated at this point in my life. I just, the idea of my body being <laughs> turned to ash creeps me out at this point. I could change my mind, but, I mean, I've got a lot of issues with death. I despise death. I hate to think about death. I told you the other day, I was doing one of these podcasts about money, and I said, the only things that are really more difficult for me to talk about than money are death and illness. You you might want to add, like, emergency accidents and those kinds of things. So I don't really enjoy this part of the conversation, especially the morbidity of the ashes going into the sea. But not just that, but okay, this which once was my grandparents, now being emptied into the ocean that way. They were so compact in the bags where their ashes were prior that, you know, there was still a sense of, like, their soul was, their two souls were both still, um, bigger in representative concrete size their bodies really rather the remains i guess you can call it so watching it all spill away into the ocean was the most 
concrete sense of truly having lost them in a more you know tangible way and so i don't know yeah you wonder about concepts like afterlife religion philosophy it's my uncle had appropriately put it as we were about, you know, to scatter the ashes. My grandparents were not, shall we say, really religious. Although it depends on the way you would pose the question. And here comes something very paramount to the way, you know, that I, my mind is formulated as we get into this conversation. My grandparents on my mother's side, Jerry and Norma Finn were identified in an ethnic sense as Jewish people. And they sort of celebrated the major Jewish holidays. Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Passover, Hanukkah. They lit the menorah, they said a few prayers, they told the stories explaining the reasons why we celebrated the holidays, did the satyrs, you know, that kind of thing. Though, to the full extent of my knowledge, they weren't the synagogue-going types. And I was one to press them on their religious beliefs when I was at a young age. Because... I had a best friend who was a Seventh-day Adventist Christian who always wanted to have the theological, philosophical, religious conversation, and that was part of prompting my own explorations on the topic. So I don't remember what age I was, but I did ask both of them, do you believe in God? And my grandparent, my grandma would say no. So, to the extent which I know, my grandmother was actually an atheist. And then I'd ask her, I'd say, but you also say you're a Jew. So how can you be both an atheist and a Jew if Jewish people believe in God? That's what the Torah says. I don't really remember what her response was to that, except to say that she never gave me a satisfying answer. As for my grandfather, his answer was that he was agnostic, though also identified as a Jew, and couldn't quite explain that contradiction to me either. Recently, I had a good conversation with Professor Leonard Winogora, Dr. Leonard Winogora, Professor of Philosophy and Political Science, and History, too, he told me, offered this on religion, saying, there's more than one way to think about religion, he said, and one of those ways is to conceptualize it in the context of traditions that are associated with certain religions. Traditions as opposed to necessarily having to be so deeply ideological. Certain observations or practices. And that's an interesting way to think about it. And that certainly might explain the sense in which my grandparents associated with some aspect of Jewishness. And maybe you could even think of that almost more like taking from you where those in your family come from in the past. So, right, the interesting thing about Judaism, too, is quite unlike Christianity. In a lot of ways, even unlike Islam, I think you could argue, is that there is a sort of interesting 
and curious relationship between a sense of being ethnically Jewish and religiously Jewish, or I guess you could say, like, Hebrew, Israeli, that is, going back and back and back, and where do you trace your lineage? You trace your lineage as a Jewish person back to the Jews of ancient Israel or of the Middle East. And again, therefore, identify perhaps with that Jewishness in a more ethnic kind of way. I've always had a really difficult time thinking about ethnicity. With religion, it's not difficult for me to think about. I don't subscribe to any so-called religion. And on the God question, in the most technical sense, you'd have to call me agnostic because I can't say I, pr I know that God exists, though I hope God exists. And my belief is that God probably does exist, though I can't prove it. So I certainly can't say with any kind of firmness that I would expect others to hold on to the way I hold on to it. And my views on God are actually, the God question are pretty complex and probably deserves a series of podcasts quite to their own. I, there is one person who she once told me the way she put it was that uh, there are personal experiences you have that I'm paraphrasing here. This was a long time ago, probably teenagers when we had the conversation. There are experiences in life that could go such a way that to the best of your understanding of things, it could seem only as though a God had been the one to orchestrate it and commune with you in those times and places. I have certainly felt that way. Could it all be my imagination in the end? I certainly say yes, it could. Though do I think it was? And I don't. And as I count my blessings as the expression goes, Though the experience of counting one's blessings is complex for me when I think about the blessings other people don't have to count and trying to wrap your mind around what one could only call sort of metaphysical injustice or you know, injustice beyond the politics, like natural injustice, injustices of the universe, genetic disease, tsunamis and other natural disasters. Being at the wrong place in the wrong time in the context of political violence in the area. You know, having the wrong creed in the wrong place. It's weird to think about luck or the, the way the dice rolls in that kind of way. And how you reconcile whether or not... It God could or couldn't have anything to do with it. That said, without getting too much further into the digression, to have the grandparents I had, to have had the mother and stepfather I've had, the siblings I've had, the family I've had, to have the wife I have, and to have escaped homelessness. I was almost homeless once. And to have escaped being hurt violently by muggers. To have gotten another chance to go to college and complete my college education. To be able to read. And for the things I read to resonate with me as they do feels all quite like quite a flood of blessings and makes me feel as if there is a God. It makes me feel very connected to this 
possible God. And the way yesterday was, as we were scattering the ashes in the Atlantic Ocean and cruising around by Atlantic City, off the shores of Atlantic City, New Jersey, there was something very romantic about it. The sunset was beautiful to look at. A line from Bob Dylan came to my mind. Look at the sun sinking like a ship. Look at the sun sinking like a ship. Ain't it just like my heart, babe, as you kiss my lips? It's a good Bob Dylan song. True poet, when, when you can be at a place in time and the mere... You know, scenery and context can bring to mind a line of poetry like that. But the point here being going back to like philosophy, religion, and afterlife, and how really at the end of the day, my grandparents philosophically certainly were not staunch advocates of the God theory. And certainly we're not staunch advocates of any kind of notion of Judaism as a religious person would really think of it, or a conventional concept of religion would be, you wouldn't associate a traditional concept of religion, I think, with whatever ultimate, I apologize for that, whatever ultimate kind of connection they had with Christianity. Oh, uh, Judaism. They had n no relationship with Christianity to full extent of my knowledge. And, you know, my grandparents have always been a un have been uniquely philosophical in their influence on me. More so, certainly, than anyone else in my family. Not to say that there aren't philosophical aspects of my mother or father, or siblings, or cousins, but I think they were all much more passively, or less assertively, or less substantively, and explicitly philosophical. Whereas m my grandparents, part of their personalities, as I knew them, was that they were philosophical people, both of them. in various ways. My grandfather had a philosopher that he held to as one he valued, in fact, explicitly. Ayn Rand. He, he loved Ayn Rand. Though he did not agree with everything she believed, he quite valued her appreciation for business. And he some aspect of her atheism, I suppose, made an impact on him. When I was about 13 and I said to him that I was an atheist, he urged me to read Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead and talked about how Ayn Rand was an atheist philosopher and that I might find some interesting, that I might gain some interesting things from her. I didn't take his advice at the time. I, when I was a teenager, I didn't like to read. Ironically, because now I love to read. That's one of my favorite ways to spend time in life is reading. But not in those days. In those days, I liked to watch movies and listen to music. But I didn't like to read. My grandparents made me think a lot. They were probably the greatest conversationalists I ever knew. As so many of our conversations would head towards some kind of intellectual and philosophical path. And you could keep a conversation going with my grandparents, at least I know I could, for pretty much as long as you could keep talking yourself. They were such great conversationalists. I'll never forget, I can't remember which New Year's it was, which New Year's Eve maybe 2007 into 2008 maybe 
2008 into 2009? I think it had to be one of those two. And I actually spent with just the two of them. Because... Talking with my grandparents is, is like listening to a jam band. Or listening to jazz. It's just It just moves... It moves in a really chill way, and it's just constantly, there's constantly this feel of a breeze on your face, and just this profound comfort, and sense of motion, and life. I always believed that my greatest memories, or almost all my greatest memories, certainly the things I remember best, especially in my younger days, are not the more concrete aspects of experience, but conversations I've had. And not even the conversations verbatim, but I remember themes and conversations I've had very well. Strange as it is. I can look back to people from over a decade ago and recall you might call uh, it their values. I remember their the way they presented their values really well. So I guess I really am a philosophical person, just naturally. But let me give you some concrete examples of how my grandparents really were forceful in making me think about so many things. I remember one time my grandma asked, What would you do if you got a girl pregnant? And I said, that just wouldn't happen, Grandma. And I was like 13, 14 at that point in my life. Not quite what you would call a playa. Not quite the sort of guy who necessarily had the opportunity to engage in an activity that would lead to a pregnancy at that time. As I was just not what some people might call a ladies' man in those days. Not that I've ever been, or that I consider myself that now. Happily married. But I, I just... Um, I actually viewed myself in a sort of conservative way at that time. Not conservative religiously, but I think it was my view that I was probably going to wait until marriage, or that I was certainly going to wait until... I was sure that I loved a girl before I had sex. And so I had these excuses to try and not answer the question that my grandma had, but she would not accept that. And she said, well, but what if you did and you had to choose? And I kept on saying, but I wouldn't. And she said, no, what would you do? And that would lead often to like the question of abortion and what I thought of abortion and would lead to her often her point of view on abortion. One of the most interesting things my grandmother had to say about abortion, she asked me this, what do you think if the woman wants an abortion, but the man does not want an abortion? Whose choice should it be? Or should what the man says matter? And I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but I remember my grandmother saying that what the man says mattered too, and that it would not be right for the woman to unilaterally have an abortion without taking deeply into consideration what the man thought. And I remember disagreeing, actually, and saying, but it's not his body, so what does it really matter? My grandmother was socially as libertarian as it gets in a lot of ways. She, for example, was deeply in favor of prostitution. I don't mean, I don't mean deeply in favor in the sense that my grandmother was renowned for being involved with male prostitutes or anything like that. However, she thought it should be legal, thought it was absurd that it wasn't, and she really had a lot of sympathy for someone who might have a reason to 
utilize the services of a prostitute. I think the way she had put it to me was, well, sometimes people just get lonely, I think was what she said. That was something she, that was a point of view she cared about. She, her, both of my grandparents gambled and liked to go to Las Vegas, liked to go to Atlantic City. It wasn't arbitrary that we scattered their ashes off the coast of Atlantic City. They loved to go to Atlantic City. They liked to gamble. Uh, they loved poker. They taught me how to play poker and blackjack. And we played all kinds of card games. They used to have these poker chips, and we'd all play the games. We never gambled with money with them. But they gambled with money, and they went to Atlantic City or Las Vegas. My grandparents used to take my little brother and I out to eat when we were teenagers almost every Monday. It was often on Mondays we went out. And we would try a different restaurant every Monday in the vicinity, anywhere we'd drive up to like 30 minutes away, northeast, west, or south. And when we would go out to eat, they liked to bring up politics. It's interesting, I've told you before, I was not political in those days, nor was I really aware of what was going on in the world around me. So I'm certainly grateful you talk about like feelings of like there being a god and things like that. The way that my grandparents forced me to think about politics, and even if it, even if I didn't follow through with the questions they raised back then, they certainly planted planted seeds in my mind, as the expression goes. One of the memories that I have is we were at, I don't remember which restaurant, maybe Applebee's, and we were talking about the war in Iraq, and my grandfather asked the waitress, she was really young, probably like 18 maybe, if that, and he asked her, what do you think about Iraq, the war in Iraq, and she got really shy, I think giggled a little bit and said, I don't know. I remember being against the war in Iraq because, as I remember it, someone who knows me might remember me saying something different. As I remember it, the idea was, unlike the situation in Afghanistan, where we knew knew that Afghanistan was essentially under the tyranny of the Taliban, and that the Taliban gave safe haven to Al-Qaeda. But that wasn't the case with Iraq. There was no, really, there wasn't any sense of a strong case for Iraq. And now they told us weapons of mass destruction, weapons of mass destruction. But as a dumb teenager who didn't think a lot about things anyway, like supposing there really was, though they didn't really find them, there it, there was no visceral feeling of a threat on my part of Iraq. Iraq. And so... Iraq? 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 So... <laughs> yes, I'm a flawed person. I don't always pronounce things correctly. And I become self-conscious of it, too. So... There was just this, to me... It didn't make sense. And in fact, by the time I was 18, I would actually become a... almost like an all-out pacifist. I don't know how that applied to Afghanistan, because I wasn't a sophisticated thinker then. Not that I'm, per se, a sophisticated thinker now, but I've certainly sophisticated in the way that I think about things now. And you could probably say that my number one interest in life is having you know, meaningful thoughts. That's why I do this. But they got me thinking about Iraq, at least. And they asked us what we thought about drugs. That was a conversation they liked to have. Should drugs be legalized? I think my initial... I don't remember what my stance was on that. I think I remember seeing both sides of it. But... For me, 
the idea of drugs was always very scary. The dare stuff at first worked quite well on me. I was terrified of so much as a drop of alcohol or marijuana until I was 18, 19. My sophomore year of college at Florida Gulf Coast University when I, for the first time, questioned my assumptions on both. But prior to that, it seemed obvious to me, drugs alter your brain, so they're probably not good for you. That was sort of the attitude, to the best of my memory, that I had. But you got to reading your Allen Ginsberg and your William S. Burroughs and your Jack Kerouac and listening to your Bob Dylan, your John Lennon, your Jim Morrison, your Paul Simon, and you become inundated with this ethos of pot smoking and drugs and it's made to have this sort of appeal did to me and all of that would on those assumptions on drugs would be obliterated you know as to the questions of legalizing drugs that's actually a policy area where i don't know a hundred percent what i do think although i certainly do not think anyone should spend so much as a second in prison merely for the consumption of a drug. I think it gets dicey when we think about the manufacture and sale of certain drugs, like heroin. There's no... I'm not aware of any kind of good intent that comes out of doing that and that you're obviously perpetrating harm on others. I'm not sure it should be legal to produce and sell heroin. I'm not sure what the case is for that. Or that that being said, if it were illegal, I, I don't necessarily also think that someone should spend their life in jail for it either. I'm not exactly sure what the perfect way to address drugs is. Except to say, I don't think anyone's life should be destroyed in the criminal justice sense. Though again, it gets dicey when you think about the culture of producing drugs and making a living off of people's addictions and self-destruction and things like that. And even with alcohol and tobacco. Yesterday was the first time I allowed alcohol in my mouth in about seven months. I couldn't have more than three sips. I just... Mm. That's a whole other conversation in itself, too. But, because it's not that I liked to drink so much. But I did to fall asleep. I did drink a lot to fall asleep before I was on Lunesta. But I enjoy my sobriety these days, and the effectser that I take is quite happy functioning without the interactions of alcohol, so. And it was also interesting about my grandparents and the conversation about drugs. My grandma did not have a problem, in particular her. My grandfather wasn't as interested in, like, the conversation about marijuana. But my grandmother did not have any qualms with marijuana, to the best of my knowledge. She opened up about smoking it when she was younger. I had once asked her, if given the opportunity, if she'd want to smoke it with me, and I think she said that would be okay. We didn't end up doing it. I mean, it was illegal back then. Anyway... And it wasn't something I was going to push, but it was a conversation we had. And she didn't, it didn't, she didn't, she wasn't, she didn't find it to be like an outrageous thing. So she did have quite that attitude. And, but they smoked cigarettes and they drank alcohol a lot. Now, I'm not saying that neither of them were alcoholics, though they smoked 
a lot. They smoked cigarette after cigarette after cigarette after cigarette. And there was a very brief time in my life when I smoked cigarettes, and there was this thrill of smoking with them for me. It was like a way of connecting, because we would share, or they would share their cigarettes with me. And, you know, we would partake in the smoking together. It was just, it was, it was a real connection kind of thing. Though, I'm glad that I don't do that anymore. They used to say they knew that it was bad for them, but they didn't care. My grandmother, in particular, really had this view of not... She didn't view... Her philosophy was not such that longevity was her number one concern. She thought about life in the context purely of enjoying it. And once the joy had been taken from her life in her older age and as she became more limited in what she could do and that really changed who she was. I could never forget very close to her death, probably within a year, her saying she said that she could die now and not care. And that scared the hell out of me. Especially when, about a year after that, she died. She had lost all sense of desire to do really anything. She really loved to travel, and my grandfather didn't like traveling anymore, and that seemed to quite depress her. And she, there wasn't this sense in her that there was anything to keep going on for. There was She lost her love of life. That was strange to witness that. Because she had such a thirst for life beforehand. But it was her view. She would rather enjoy her alcohol and cigarettes and die a little younger. It was a trade-off. And there is a conversation to have about the degree to which you might say there could or couldn't be a trade-off on things like that. Myself, I don't like to... Well, first of all, alcohol and smoking, neither of them give me any joy anyway. Alcohol leads to really bad hangovers and... I think is quite taxing on the brain. Smoking, I never really understood smoking. It was something I just, it was just a bad habit I just picked up. It wasn't terribly relaxing for me at all. In fact, sometimes it would, it, it is a stimulant, and at times it actually gave me anxiety. But I did it, I don't know, it made me feel. Smoking cigarettes made me feel very spiritual, though, that I was communing with the universe. Actually, for a time, so did alcohol. Even as I had that, those few sips of whiskey last night on the boat, I wasn't really thinking so much about the experience of getting drunk or those aspects of the alcohol. I was thinking about the taste and how it was of the earth. Of course... You know, all things in the earth become of the earth, so that's a stupid thing. But that's how I thought about it then. Another really awesome, awesome thing about my grandparents is that inherent in their ethics was the belief in dreams, support of people's dreams. Just like, especially my grandma, especially, in particular, her being so interested in, you know, the joys of life. You want to experience the pleasure of prostitution? Go for it. You want to get high? Go for it. You want to gamble? Go for it. She loved 
she was almost, I don't know if she would call herself this, but there was something sort of hedonistic in particular about my grandmother. In particular. Uh, but a part of that for her was the idea that people should aim big in life and achieve their dreams. She was very supportive. Both my grandparents were extremely supportive of my artistic endeavors. Even my poetry. They even read my poetry and gave feedback. My grandmother in particular was very aggressive in her feedback as well and very blunt. I remember I was 16 and I gave her a book worth of poems that I wrote. Not an actual book, but I don't know, 40 pages printed and stapled that I thought of as a book and shared with her. And her number one criticism was that it was too much about romantic love. They were all like reading the same thing to her. It was what I remember her saying. My grandmother was never the type who was going to pacify you with nice words and worry about hurting your feelings or anything like that. And maybe she was with other people, I don't know, not with me. There was a time when I went on about how, I've told you about my nihilistic phases, and I would spout various applications of nihilistic philosophy with my grandmother, and she would yell, in fact, and call it bullshit. One of the last things I remember about her was when I would talk about my love for America. And this was before I was really all that aware politically and had this... I don't, I don't remember where my early interest in America came from and why I said it at that time exactly. I think I was just interested in capitalism or like the idea of making money. But I had said something about how I loved America. And my grandmother said, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. You can't love something you don't know about. That's one of those things like I never forgot in life. And almost exactly since that time, it's been important to me to know what I talk about. And especially as I think about America, to know what I talk about. And it was around the time of her passing back in maybe 2010, 2011, 2009? Somewhere between 2009 and 2011, I don't remember exactly. That was around the time when I was first really plunging into the news, reading the newspapers and contemplating all things politics after she passed away. And I, it was true that, in fact, I didn't know anything about America when I had made that comment. So my grandmother called it like it was, called it like she saw it anyway. And she was, in that sense, always extraordinarily Socratic with me. Anything I ever said, anytime, she always questioned. She never took anything as given. So, like, when I think about my writing process, even in my thought process, I have learned to be really quite critical in tremendous part in thanks to her habitual, nearly pedantic approach to thinking. I don't say she is, she was not pedantic, but I would say she was fastidious. But one might argue, or get the impression, or think she could have been pedantic, because she, she was cantankerous, too. Her and my grandpa would get into a lot of arguments. I mean, not like the kind of argument that you felt was about to be the end of a marriage kind of an argument, but they just argued about little things, and they did it a lot of the time, and they did it right in front of everybody. They just didn't care. My grandmother was so supportive of my dream to be a poet when I was young. She once said, If, instead of going to college, you would like it, I will write you a check 
and you can spend some time in Greenwich Village and just write. And of course, I didn't take her up on that offer. Not just because the prospect actually scared the hell out of me, but the intensity of that generosity was way too much for me. I wouldn't have felt okay about that. But that was the intensity with which she clearly expressed a interest in me developing my sense of art. And I think about that now as I'm here talking to you, making this podcast. And I have to think that she would actually quite appreciate this. I don't even think to this moment I've ever thought quite about what it really means to have someone believe in you that much. I tell people, oh, I'm doing this podcast, or I'm doing this video blog, I'm doing this website, and the common response I get is, yeah, but what else are you doing? In other words, people are very cynical about creative endeavors that people take on. There's a lot of cynicism about anyone being able to succeed in highly creative or independent, even to some extent, entrepreneurial endeavors. I used to take that kind of thing very personally or be very annoyed by it. Now I just, it makes me feel bad that people feel so I think it's a reflection of how we feel about society and the economy. It's sad to think that the American dream that my grandfather believed in and my grandmother believed in, it's sad to think that so many people don't believe in that now. And there are a lot of reasons why to believe in it and why not to believe in it. But my grandmother was the kind of person if you really want to be a poet, then here's the means to go do it. Now go fucking do it. That's the kind of person my grandmother was. And that's the kind of person I want to be, too. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. One reason why. My grandfather, very similar. You know, they, they come from an interesting... The context for them is very interesting, both of my grandparents. On my grandmother's side, I can really see why she thinks the way she thinks in that w way. Understand that on her side of the family, now I don't know too much about her mother at all, my great-grandmother, but my great-grandfather, her father, whose name was Israel, by the way, though we all referred to him as Pup-Up Chief, his actual name was Israel. And Israel came from Russia. And I don't know the details surrounding his fleeing from Russia. He was a Jew. He was very young. And he did leave during a period in which there were a plethora of pogroms you know, uh, massacres against the Jews. And he got away from all of that as a boy, a little boy, on a boat to America. And he managed to make something of himself, investing in stocks, and he opened a dress shop. I don't think in that order, necessarily. I think he did the dress shop first. And... He did okay for himself. I don't know that I don't know the degree to which he made money. Like I don't know how wealthy or unwealthy he was. I know that he would not end up a poor person. And for a while my grandpa, my grandmother's husband, grandpa worked f I I'm, I'm, not, I'm saying like because we're using so many different great grandfather, grandmother, like so many uh, pronouns, not pronouns here, nouns here, that um, I just want to make sure that I'm very exact. 
I do also, like my grandma, come on to the verge of pedanticness so much so that I can get little bouts of anxiety and start to gaff. So there is a sense of legacy coming from my great-grandfather Israel having a sort of ambitiousness and making something happen of that. With respect to my grandfather, I don't know really the story is about his parents. I don't know anything really about that. I can tell you, though, that my grandfather grew up very poor. And that there were some dark aspects of his childhood. He went to school initially in Allentown, New Jersey, and was picked on for being Jewish. Someone called him a Christ killer once, and he got into a big fight with someone on the school bus as a result of that. And the way to not have to deal with that anymore was he ended up going, changing high schools and going to Heightstown High School. But my grandfather grew up relatively poor, is what I'm told. However, got a scholarship to go to Rutgers University, but didn't take it was kind of bummed out that his father died when he was very young. He was like 16, I think, when his father died. And just didn't want to go to college. Ended up joining the military, actually. And things worked out for him in the military because he got to crack codes during the Korean War and got to enjoy an interesting period of life as a result of that. And when he came out of the military, he had this interest in real estate and had a way with people such that, I think the way he tells me the story is he was in conversation with someone who said something like, I'd like a house like that, or I like that kind of house. And my grandfather said, I could build that for you. And the guy gave him cash and said, do it. And like that, my grandfather became a force of real estate in East Windsor, New Jersey, in that surrounding area. And there were streets. There are streets in East Windsor named after my parents. And my, my, <laughs> my mother and my uncles. And things like that. My grandfather... Really, he even built an entire community called Twin Rivers in East Windsor. He made quite a name for himself in real estate and also got into what they call commercial real estate. Though, and this is where, this is just something I relate to very much, find very romantic and beautiful. My grandfather had this idea of commercial real estate that wasn't yet so much of a thing at the time that he was thinking about it. And he was seeking out a loan. I don't remember when, like, I don't know what the, what time in the history of his life exactly this was, but the way he tells me this, told me the story was that he went out to California, he took a flight to California, trying to get a loan for his, this idea to start a commercial real estate business, and he tells me he was laughed out of the room. He says he came back to New Jersey and made it happen anyway, and he ended up making a very successful international commercial real estate company and did quite well for himself and was always an advocate of entrepreneurial efforts and being ambitious and aiming high. And that is something that I forever value. And again, as I, as I think about talking to you now and wanting to have it have a uh, economic, financial, spiritual, entrepreneurial value to it, I think of my grandfather and you know, so I think of both of my grandparents and I know that 
if they believed that this is something I really believed in and that this is something that I was going to apply to in such a way that it would be treated like a business and treated like a act of passionate contribution to society, that they would want me to keep on doing this. And they would believe in it. And they would pick it apart and tell me what they liked and didn't like. And they would say, if anyone tells you that this is going to fail, just don't listen to them. And just do it anyway. Just like when my grandfather was lapped out of the room for his commercial real estate idea. He just went ahead and did his thing anyway and became quite a success. I am extraordinarily lucky to have the grandparents I had. I wish that I could talk to them at this very moment. Apologize for how stupid I was when I was younger. You know, I went through like a lot of like anxiety issues, especially around the, up to the point where my the grandmother had passed away. I had not even yet had what I call my great transformation. I had not yet reached when I was 25 and I started doing the whole logical thinking approach to life thing. So, my grandmother really only got to see me hit a lot of walls, hit my head on a lot of walls, so to speak, hit a lot of roadblocks. I had a lot of sort of raw ambition in life, and I tried really hard to be interesting artistically and intellectually, but I always failed. In front of her. I always wanted her to see me be really successful. I think of her now, though I'm inspired to make something out of this. My grandmother liked to listen to the radio. Podcasting is very similar to radio, so that's what makes me think of it. It's a better version of radio. Maybe my grandmother would love podcasts. She used to play the radio late at night. That's how she would go to bed. She would lay in bed and she would have often WABC or WOR radio stations play in the background, talk radio. And so sometimes when we'd lay in bed with my grandma and grandpa and it was late at night, they would play it. So you know, exposed to that. And I thought that was really interesting. So for a while, I started listening to talk radio late at night. I would listen to Dr. Joy Brown, and I would listen to the Drudge Report when I was very young. I don't remember how old, but like 13, 12, 13, 14, 15, around that age. And it's interesting now. I also listened to New Jersey 101.5. For those of you who don't live in New Jersey or the Central Jersey area, that may mean nothing to you. But New Jersey 101.5 was interesting because they had neat talk shows where they really talked about issues in life. There was this woman named Roberta Gale who would come on. She she liked to talk about sex. She wasn't quite as shocking as Howard Stern or anything. But there was nothing you couldn't really talk about with Roberta Gale. She had claimed to have two vaginas, you know, things like that. And I would go to sleep listening to Roberta Gale late at night. It's interesting now, at 33 years old, and I put on MSNBC at night and go to sleep to that. I feel such a spiritual connection to my grandmother in that way. We both like to have the news on late at night. It helps us both sleep. That's what I'm going to say about them for now, as we do get into the going over an hour mark here. I guess I just want to say that certainly this 
special episode is dedicated to my grandparents. Any of you out there listening, contemplating what you're doing in your life, thinking about whether or not you should live for your dreams or settle for the crappy job at the pressure of others telling you to settle, I hope you'll take my grandparents' advice and do what you really want. That's what I'm doing. I hope that's what you'll do. It'll make for a better economy anyway. A more romantic world. In a way, my grandparents were romantics. I'm sure you could come up with a list of criticisms. My grandmother could be a bit harsh, come across even mean at times. She was so blunt, saying that you're full of bullshit and sounding so angry at just finding like a little contradiction. However, I mean, she really did have... She, there, she was just something inherently philosoph- philosophical about her. She really had views of what the so-called good life might be. And she lived for that. My grandfather... I don't know what if that was necessarily... For my grandmother, I think she was more flamboyantly philosophical and for the good life, whatever that was. My grandfather, I think, was just more of an entrepreneur. Of a creative mind. A productive mind. A social mind. Though both of them really passionately believed in dreams... I know few people in the universe who believed so deeply in the American dream as they did. And wow, is it inspiring. And wow, am I grateful. Grandma, Grandpa, if you can hear me out there in the Others of the ghost world, or however any of that like spiritual stuff could theoretically work. If you're out there and can hear me in any way, shape, or form, I want you to know I love you very both I want I want you to know, both of you, that I love you very much. I dedicate this to you, and that you have succeeded in instilling in me a belief in the importance of having a so-called dream and doing everything you can to make it, bring it to fruition. And I thank you for making me that kind of person. Because even if I failed all life long, it would, for me, give life so much more meaning than not having at least tried. Because of the two of you, I have a kind of determination within the depths of my soul that gives me bouts of confidence I would not have otherwise had, perhaps. I miss you both. I love you both. I'm sorry for any ways in which I may have disappointed either of you. But I want you to know that As I live each day, I will be thinking about your values and how they've influenced me and how I will try to live up to the virtues that you taught me. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, so much for joining me on this episode of Public Comment, a podcast devoted to politics and philosophy for critical, creative, and introspective thinkers. Have a fantastic day, and I'll chat with you again later. Bye.